Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. So we are going to, uh, it's not going to be a developer talk. Uh, this one, it's more about a kind of an unusual way of using Cordova for uh, applications that you might not have seen before. So the talk was Cordova and Citizen Science. So let's see uh, what this is about. So um, like, like I said, so I'm an Adobe employee. I'm here more as a volunteer for an organization called SafeCast. This is what I do as part of my, my volunteer work. And some of you, or probably most of you, might not be familiar with uh, SafeCast. SafeCast is an organization, an NGO, that's all about open environmental data. Um, very interesting. Rather than explain it to you at length, I have a little video. Uh, that's a couple, couple of minutes that will explain what's, where SafeCast came from and what we do. So let's, uh, let's roll it with sound. If we... Can we add sound? Yes. So the three of us are just talking, where can we find information? Oh, we can't find radiation data anywhere. And it's not because it's not being published, it's because it doesn't exist. Nobody was paying attention to this stuff. And so that's when we decided that we could start pooling our resources to get equipment, get equipment in people's hands, and go collect some of this data and publish it so that there would at least be something available. Within a week, we had 20, 25 people all in this Skype chat room brainstorming and trying to figure out a solution to this problem. We're looking online and we couldn't get any Geiger counters. Literally within 24 hours, the whole world supply was uh, sold out. When we realized that we couldn't get the equipment, we decided that the only way to get this done is let's go and build it ourselves. So we came up with the idea that if we put a Geiger counter on a car and we drive around with it, we can collect radiation and put it on the map. Only problem was is we didn't have the equipment, we didn't have the system. So solution was go to Tokyo Hackerspace where there was lots of people that knew how to put things together. And on the sixth day after we had the idea, we had a working system. The next day we were off to Fukushima doing our first measurements. As we started taking measurements, we saw that a reading can change like 100% just by crossing a street. And that's when we realized that it was really important for us to take very granular street by street readings every five seconds and publish really granular data so that people can drill all the way down and see exactly what the reading is right in front of their house, not an average of the entire city. After a couple of months, we realized that it would be much better for volunteers to have something that would be very concise and compact. As we redeveloped the whole system and we were able to use Arduinos and open hardware to fit it into a bento box. And that's how we came up with the bento a Geiger system. Once we built one, we taught other people to build many more of them. And that really allowed us to scale up dramatically. Well, this is a disaster. This is a tremendous opportunity to take this tons of data that's being collected and try to understand what the effects on people is. That can only happen if we share the data and we put the medical data together with the radiation data. And right now the key to combining data is to make it open. And so one of the really important features of the SafeCast project is we're using a CC0 public domain dedication for all of the data so that we can try to get people to do data science on it. We found out from Fukushima that the experts really weren't very helpful. And in fact, that citizen science actually works. We were able to collect more data than all the projects in history, and a lot of scientists came together. And by pulling through the network, we were able to become the best in the world. So I think what SafeCast proves is that all the preparation in the world, all the money in the world, still fails if you don't have a rapid, agile, resilient system. Because of the internet, because of our agility, because of our openness, within weeks, we had the world's experts together to do this. And within a year, we're the biggest project that has ever existed in this kind of monitoring. And I think it really shows that with the right people and the right resources and agility, you can beat the pants off of any government pre-planning or institutional system. And so this is SafeCast. Um, really interesting project you have radiation electronics, Arduino, uh, databases, GIS systems. So for, for a geek, it's really interesting, and it is actually a very useful project, too. So you might ask, uh, what does Cordova have to do with all this? So as you saw during the, the video, so what we did um, very fast was design these big IGE, these bento IGEs, that are, let's not play it a second time, that are actually kits. As you can see, this is a big idea. If you want to build one, it is possible. Uh, it comes like this. It's an interesting device. I have one here. 
it's a, an actual professional Geiger counter. It's got a GPS, it's got recording, etc. Uh, more than 40 hours of battery life. Once you put everything together, it looks like what I have in my hand. What's interesting here is that we have an option for a Bluetooth low energy module um, on, the, on the device. And Bluetooth low energy means that it will output all its readings to, for instance, an app. And the idea behind the app was really that this is the, the real challenge the, an app solves. If you are driving around with a, a big ID, this is some, the classic way you do this. You just put it on the side of your car, as you saw in the video. You turn it on. You do your drive. This can be from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours. And then once you're done, you need to remove it from the car. You need to clean it or dry it, depending on the weather. You need to open it. You need to remove the micro SD card. You need to find the adapter for the micro SD, which you lost. Uh, you need to put it in your computer, find a file. You see the ID. It's, it adds a lot of friction between volunteers who are willing to spend time doing these surveys and actually getting the data into uh, the Safecast API. With an app, on the other hand, this makes things a lot easier. So just install your uh, device, you turn it on, and then you just fire up your app, you click record, and then you do your drive. And once you're done, you stop recording and you send your data. So it solves a very specific, uh, very specific issue. You still get your data on the micro SD in case anything goes wrong. At the end of the day, what's important here is not all the, all the gear, it's the actual data you are collecting. And so this is how, as a volunteer for Safecast, I decided to, uh, to create the Safecast Drive app. You can find it on the Android uh, App Store. So as you can see here, very simple, you have your big ID, and the app is going to act as a recording system, is going to act as a dashboard, and then a way to review your drives and submit them to the API. So let's uh, zoom in a bit. So this is really what the app looks like. This is a, a work I did yesterday, actually, in, a, in the center of the city. As you can see, there's one place where radioactivity is a bit higher is the dam because of all the, the granite pavement over there. And so once you're done with this, you just send your, select your logs, review them, and send them to the API. So this is all created using Cordova. And what's uh, interesting that I realized during the day that this app actually touches on a lot of points that were raised uh, earlier during the, during the day, as you will see. Uh, I think it's an interesting use case for um, Cordova because of a couple of uh, design constraints for an app like this. First of all, it has to have very low battery drain. Um, it needs to run in the background when you are using your, uh, when you have your Geiger counter connected. Typically, when I do uh, long drives, if it's in the back of the car, I don't want to have my phone doing only this. I want to have Google Maps to, to help me uh, find my way, etc. So it needs to run reliably in the background. Second, the user interface has to be simple. The idea is not to, uh, to learn how to use it. As you could see, it's literally a two-button interface. You connect, you record, and that's about it. Um, it has to work 100% without network coverage. We have people going pretty much all over the world doing surveys from uh, weird, uh, very radioactive places in Kazakhstan, all the way to uh, national parks in the US where there is absolutely no uh, mobile phone coverage. And so I use PouchDB for this sort of thing. I totally agree. It's, uh, it's a really good uh, way of, of storing, uh, storing data and then synchronize it afterwards. Likewise, it has to be able to support many drives. And then the last bit that's interesting, some of you might have been at uh, PhoneGap Day uh, last year where we talked about BLE quite a lot. So this is a nice real-life implementation of using uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, so I'll just touch on all of these areas for the rest of the, um, of the talk, and then I'll take your, your questions. So the first, first one really is background mode. It's an interesting um, topic for Android apps in general, because as Android 
uh, evolves, you can see with Android O, for instance, Google is trying more and more to really kind of neutralize any app that's not in the foreground. It's a good way to, to save battery, and it's mostly understandable for a lot of apps that don't really need to do much if they lose focus. Um, for this one, it's a little bit different because we need to still communicate over Bluetooth, we still need to store data. Um, so fortunately, we have back, um, plugins in Cordova such as a background mode or a watch position that are plugins that are kind of doing workarounds on Android and still enable notifications and foreground services. Foreground services mean actually running in the background. And so this kind of increases the chance of your app running for a very long time, uh, unless you really blow up your phone with tons of apps in, um, in, um, at the same time, because Android will get uh, uh, a little bit complicated in, in these uh, situations. So background mode is absolutely key. The second one, which is kind of related, is low power. The idea here is that using this app should not have any sort of impact on the, on the battery life of your phone. Bluetooth low energy by itself doesn't really use, as the name indicates, doesn't really use much energy. So it's, uh, compared to traditional Bluetooth, it's very good. Um, what I did here is at the end of the day, sometimes simple things are very powerful. Typically, whenever there are calculations related to the UI, so you saw Google Maps, you saw a fancy graph, you saw quite a lot of things. So as soon as the app loses focus, I just skip every complicated computation. I do a lot of um, embedded development in electronics where you want to get your uh, current consumption as low as possible, so that's a lot of good habits to, to get to save milliamps and microamps. You can actually apply the same sort of thing on your Android apps to save power. Any computation you don't do saves a little bit of battery. And this is something that goes a long way. Um, this app can just run. Typically, we encourage volunteers to keep those in planes when you do long, uh, long haul travel to monitor radiation in flight. Um, so this means your phone will be running for uh, you know, up to 10 hours in a row connected to your, uh, to your device. And it works perfectly well. The next one, and uh, this touches on uh, Alex's remarks uh, this morning, um, you also have to keep your memory in check. Again, this is an app that's going to do active work for up to 10, 12 hours in a row. Um, if, you, if you're not careful, you will, I mean, you will identify any memory leak very, very fast, and the app will just stop. Uh, Android will aggressively clean up anything that goes out of, uh, out of bounds. So, it's not a talk about memory leaks or memory management, but same, same sort of uh, recommendations. Closures will, will get you if you're not careful. Event listeners that you don't unsubscribe to will end up uh, creating tons of problems. So you need garbage collector or not to deallocate variables whenever you, whenever you need. There's a, actually good, um, <clears throat> a good link from IBM that is a nice background. It's pretty old, but these sort of things haven't changed in... Um, in JavaScript for a long time. Good background on the garbage collector and a sort of patterns you need to avoid or to mitigate if you want to be sure that memory stays in, a, stays in check. The next aspect in this app, which is good fun, is so communicating with the actual hardware, the BLE. So Bluetooth Low Energy, have you, has any of you in the, the audience used Bluetooth Low Energy in your apps? Couple of people. That's good. So for those who have not used BLE, in a nutshell, it's, a, it's actually very simple. You have devices. You scan for your device. You discover services. Services have characteristics. You just read, write, or subscribe to characteristics. And that's about it. The reason why BLE is fairly popular, as far as I'm concerned, is really for two reasons. First of all, Bluetooth had a lot of security built in. By default, you know, the whole pairing that everybody sets to uh, zero, 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 or one, two, three, four. Everyone decided to kind of do away with any concept of security with Bluetooth Low Energy. Bluetooth Low Energy supports the same security, but every device manufacturer decided to remove it by default. And the second one that was um, a very big factor, Apple 
got very open-minded with BLE, and they had limited iOS uh, API access to Bluetooth a lot. You could just do a couple of things. With BLE, they let pretty much everything, uh, everything go. So at the end of the day, it's easy to work with BLE, and it's become very uh, ubiquitous. So when it comes to using BLE on Cordova, there are two major plugins for Bluetooth Low Energy. I'm using Cordova plugin Bluetooth LE. Um, very big API. Again, not difficult, though you have to watch out because there are tons of small quirks. Um, Bluetooth Low Energy support is still fairly recent. Every new Android release, every new API level introduces new calls. So if you want very wide support, which is the case for this app, uh, we wanted it to work on the Kindle Fire, because it's a super cheap um, Android device. We wanted it to work on any device that volunteers bring. It meant we have to, be, to give up a lot of APIs. Uh, there's tons of little things like a lot of devices cannot connect to BLE for 10 seconds after you enable Bluetooth. So things that catch you as soon as it's on the, as soon as you get outside of a testing mode. And uh, so that's uh, things to watch out for. But in practice, the good thing is that it's, once it gets going, it's very stable. And when you lose connection for whatever reason, so you walk away at some point, you don't break the connection, it just resumes whenever you, whenever you come back. The next uh, aspect, which is the last point I wanted to touch on, is keeping the app simple. I think it's a general principle for most, uh, most apps, but when it comes to uh, volunteer organizations, it's especially important. Volunteers donate their time. Um, they like the cause, they, they are interested, but when volunteers get frustrated, very often they, they move on, they just do something else. So we needed to remove friction again as much as possible. So that meant first time use had, is absolutely critical on this app. And I spent quite a lot of time with the rest of the team whenever we did uh, build workshops with the Big ID to watch how people use the app on the first time, what works, what doesn't. And so right now, whenever you install SafeCast Drive, it's going to ask you for a login, a password. It will scan automatically for your Big ID. It will enable Bluetooth after your permission, if necessary. And then you're, you're done. It's all set up, and you can focus on doing, job, doing your job with your uh, gag counter. And again, so as soon as you create apps where you have, so especially the Android ecosystem, which is very complex, where you use edge peripherals and external hardware, you run into uh, lots of interesting use cases for testing. So for those of you who were at uh, the workshops yesterday, we had a good workshop on uh, unit testing and end-to-end -end testing. As soon as you add external hardware, uh, this creates a, a lot of complexity. And at some point, as far as I can tell, I haven't found any way to fully automate that sort of thing because you still have to manipulate a lot of, uh, a lot of hardware. Another aspect as well um, that was important, the drive part of Safecast Drive. So most of the people who do these surveys hang this on their car. So the user interface has to be kept simple. So it, you can decide to have just a map or just the graph or even just the radioactivity reading. As you saw, the radioactivity reading is fairly large. The idea is not to have small characters that will distract the driver. Uh, a lot of people have this running on their dashboard, so that's an important one. And still this is, so, so far, mostly an Android uh, app, so it needs to cater to power users. Uh, yesterday, again, during the workshops, we realized that nearly all the audience used Androids uh, compared to the general population where iOS tends to have a majority. So Android users tend to be more more technical and like to go further. So there is a whole set of options on this app that are behind menus, so that standard users don't need to worry about them, but poor users can go a lot, uh, uh, a lot further. I could go on uh, for a long time. It also supports serial over USB, serial over Bluetooth, so there are tons of options to support various kinds of uh, gag counters as well. So as a conclusion, this is one app that contains about 12 major plugins um, that go from Bluetooth LE to serial over USB or Bluetooth, geolocation, 
background mode, screen, screen dimming, so keeping the screen awake, which is necessary if you want to keep it uh, on your dashboard, file storage access, mapping, I didn't touch on mapping at all, but you saw that it uses Google Maps and it uses actually the HTML version of Google Maps, it works really well and uh, makes it very easy to be accepted on the Amazon App Store as well, because you don't need to go through uh, the native Google Maps component and the weird uh, Amazon requirements for the API. The APK is not too, not too big, and so, so far, we just have a minority of Geiger counters with BLE, so we have about 50 people who use the app uh, all the time. It's just 1,000 devices anyway in the field. Um, we have quite, quite a few drives uploaded in 2017. As SafeCat, we are going to release an update to the Big ID that contains Bluetooth Low Energy by default. Right now, people need to buy a little module that's like 20 bucks, so not everybody has it. Um, so we kind of expect usage to go up sharply in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, the last bit that I have not uh, mentioned, and that will be, I think, interesting for everyone, is that, as you saw Joy Ito during the, the video, uh, he was mentioning that all the data in Safecast is CC0, which is the most open license, it's public domain. Uh, you can't really have an open data organization, especially for uh, topics that are as sensitive as radioactivity that raise a lot of uh, passion. You cannot have an open data organization if you are not able to show openness all the way from getting the reading all the way into your API. So for this reason, not only is the data set CC0, but everything we do is under an MIT license. That means that this app, if you go to github.com slash safecast, you can just download the code and it's all open. Uh, the API code, which hosts, you saw a mention of 40 million points in 2016, we are past 80 million readings, so it's a, it scales up pretty nicely. We get about 2 million new data points every month. And the code is open, it's a big uh, Ruby on rail and a Postgres uh, infrastructure, and even the hardware is open under Creative Commons. So if you want to take a look at this, uh, at this app, and as, a, as an example of the integration of a lot of, uh, of cool technologies, it's there. And with this, if you have any question, I'm available, thank you. Wow. I love that grassroots effort to build that product. Yeah. Uh, any, any questions? All right, we got one here. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you use a, the typical clicking sound as well while, while driving um, so you can keep the screen off. That's a very good point. Not in the app. No, we haven't done that. No, because the, what we send is a reading every five seconds, so we can't have a clicking sound. Could probably simulate it, but um, but the actual one it does click. If you open it, it clicks. If you close it, you can't really hear the click because if you're in a plane or something like that, gets the attention of way too many people. <laughs> <laughs> it already blinks and all, so it's. Uh... <laughs> it's I never got stopped by anyone. I, I've taken this one on countless uh, plane plane trips open, so no one has ever asked questions or interested. Flight attendants are very uh, sensitive to the topic of radiation in the air, so usually they, they are interested to chat about it. Go ahead. iOS support. Sorry? iOS support. So iOS support, very good question. So it does work on iOS. Um, the practical situation is that safe, in SafeCast we had one volunteer who wrote an iOS app on his own, um, so this is the app that we have in the, in, the, in the store for this. It's different, it's got a very, very simple look. The interesting part here is that volunteers being volunteers, uh, people come and go, so we have the option for Safecast Drive to push it uh, to the macOS store very easily if we realize that support for the iOS app uh, is, uh, is not uh, going well. But the app works on iOS. True, yes, no, as I, 
as I mentioned, it's more of an organizational thing. We had someone who had done an iOS app. We didn't want uh, to get people confused and have two different apps for the same, uh, the same organization. So that's the, that's the reason. They both work the same way and they send data to the same place. And as I mentioned earlier, what's important here is the actual data. The rest is just support. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. It's time for our next break.